Uh, dear members of the Haid family, uh, Professor Yochanan Friedman, uh, Professor Arnon Cohen, <laughs> Professor Amy Singer, and Dr. Avi Rubin, the organizers of this uh, conference. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, I'm both delighted and honored to chair a panel that is dedicated to the Ottoman sources and their use by historians. The significant role of the late Professor Haid in using Ottoman primary documents is evident to all those who explore Ottoman history. Furthermore, his status as one of the major contributors to the so-called archival term in writing Ottoman history is equally clear and well remembered. The two speakers in the panel suggest a kind of imagined dialogue with the studies conducted by Professor Head, showing both continuity, but also new perceptions and understanding of these sources. The heroes in this panel are the sources themselves. In Amy case, the Muhime documents, while Guy explores the collection of legal, collections of legal opinions. These are two different kinds of sources that were explored and studied by Professor Head and are still, as we will see immediately, studied today in our attempt to better understand Ottoman societies. As I said, we have two uh, speakers in this panel, and with your permission, I will briefly introduce them before letting them present or summarize the papers that we all had the chance to read. Our first speaker is Professor Emi Singer from Tel Aviv University. Emi teaches Ottoman and Turkish history in the Department of Middle Eastern and African History at Tel Aviv University. Her previous uh, publications are numerous. I will uh, uh, refer here to her first book, The Palestinian Peasants and Ottoman Officials, that appeared in 1994, Constructing Ottoman Beneficents, that was published in 2002, Charity and Islamic Society, 2008. And at present, Amy's research focuses on the city of Edirne, particularly in the area of Murad II. Her other major project absorbing her attention is the Open Ottoman Initiative, or formerly the Digital Ottoman Platform, which aims to create a digital portal for connecting scholars and projects, incubating new digital resources and exploring how digital tools and capacities can enhance and sustain Ottoman studies. She is currently serving also as a president of the Ottoman and Turkish Association. Her talk today is entitled Following Uriel Head to Edirne, a 16th century journey with the Muhimme Defterleri. Amy, please. Good afternoon to you all. Um, it's an honor to be here, to be part of this symposium. Uh, I never knew Uriel Haid, but I've had the privilege of knowing his children, of meeting you at more than one symposium, and of studying with um, several people who are present here and others who studied with Uriel Haid. So in the genealogy of Ottoman studies, I think that makes me his granddaughter. Uh, so in keeping with um, the structure of this kind of a meeting where we submitted our papers uh, well in, in advance and, um, and are mostly focusing on the discussion, I'm going to speak rather briefly uh, and try and highlight a few things uh, from my paper, but also perhaps uh, say something a little bit um, more critically. Okay, so my first point would be that um, following my title, following Hade to Edirne, a journal with the Muhime, one of Hade's most well-known books internationally was um, the book entitled Ottoman Documents on Palestine, which was published in 1960. And this book has two parts. The first part of it is a very detailed discussion of the structure uh, of a particular group of documents which we largely accept were drafts uh, of imperial orders that were issued from, um, from the divan, from the sultans, uh, by the sultan. 
Uh, there are various discussions about whether they were drafts made after the fair copies were issued or before, uh, and Hay discusses that at length, and people have then gone on from his work and discussed that further. But the second part of his work was a group of translations of original documents from the Ottoman archives into English, um, translations that were heavily annotated, which made it possible for people who didn't know Arabic or didn't know Arabic, uh, Ottoman Turkish to read original documents uh, that were issued from the Ottoman center that had to do with a vast array of subjects um, in the history of Ottoman Palestine from the mid 16th century to the early 17th century. And this was at a time when not only were the, was it hard to get to the Ottoman archives and read them in the originals, but there, was, um, there were very few translations that people could work with. So it was a very exciting publication and it was really a landmark publication that is constantly referenced uh, even today as being a kind of point of departure. For things. And I thought it would be interesting to think about what he did and what we might have done today because his publication was a printed book uh, with a few photographs in the back of original documents. Um, and it was well footnoted and cross indexed and cross referenced. The volume that I've been working with to try to follow him to Edirne is a publication that came out in 2002, so from 1960 to 2002. Um, and that publication is a collection of transcriptions from Arabic characters to Latin characters of an entire volume of Muhime, probably the, the earliest volume of Muhime that we have, which uh, covers 1544 to 1545, a period of about five months in the winter from December through April. And that was published by a man named Halil Sahiliolu, who was one of the most gifted um, deciphers of Ottoman handwriting. He was the pinnacle of people to whom we would turn in the archives, and we saved him for the hardest things that we looked at. So in 2002, he published a whole volume in transcription that had very good indexes that included a number of tables um, to sort of walk, sort through the, the provenance and the dating of these documents. And in addition, there was a CD of all of the originals, which was an amazing thing to have because it meant that you didn't have to rely on his transliterations, even though they were, ex they were extremely good, but you could actually look at the originals and you could take the book home with you. Um, today, we wouldn't, that wouldn't be enough. Today, we would want to have this, this text of transliterations to be a PDF, to have it be OCR'd, so that we could use the kinds of advanced software we now have for searching text uh, almost universally and trying to find correlations um, and um, draw um, comparisons between documents to look in a kind of concordance way, to look for proximity of words to other words, and all the kinds of sophisticated things that we can now do in text analysis by using, um, by using digital tools. So it's very interesting to look where we started with Hade uh, and where, what we might do um, if we, had, we were going to do a similar project today in 2018. And I think that that's an important point to make uh, in thinking about his achievement and thinking about what our challenges are today. The second thing that I'd like to do is just to talk briefly about Edirne, the city that I work on. It's on the Greek Turkish border today, just inside uh, the, the Turkish border. It's also quite close to the Bulgarian border. And the main question that uh, I take with me in virtually every aspect of my work is where is Edirne? And it starts from the problem that uh, given the importance of this city, which was um, the second capital of the empire, it's actually been very, very little studied. And so that's the premise that I start with in all my research. Uh, and what I did for this project was to take a whole volume of this whole volume of Muhime and to see if I read one volume of Muhime, whether I could learn anything about the city of Edirne for the period in the 16th century that those documents um, come from, but also to ask those documents whether they have anything to tell me about the first half of the 15th century, 100 years early, which is what I'm actually really interested in. Um, so what I, um, what I did was I went looking through this volume to see um, what it could say to me. 
Um, and in fact, uh, it's actually it's quite interesting because there are about I think 544 firmans entries in this register, of which only three actually have anything really to do about a DNA, and the rest were simply issued from a DNA, um, and that's quite frustrating on the one hand, but on, on the other, it tells me that Edirne was so obviously a place where the sultan was that it wasn't a, it wasn't a point of interest to say much about it, um, and that business went on as usual, whether the sultan was in Edirne or in Istanbul or any place else. Uh, and that, I think, is quite um, different from the way we often perceive the Ottoman Empire and the way we teach it uh, as being an empire based on three successive capitals, which was very, uh, very much uh, in place and anchored to those capitals. And I think that by looking at Edirne and looking at the transit between Istanbul and Edirne, but then from Edirne to the various fronts, we can see that it, there was actually quite a mobile capital. Uh, and then it sends us back to ask a whole bunch of questions about, okay, well, what is a capital? Uh, at this point in time, and what does it mean then that Edirne is an alternate capital? One of the things that was most attractive about Edirne for the sultans um, was that it wasn't Istanbul. It was away from the sort of throbbing center, huge city uh, of the empire. The other was that it had great hunting. So it was uh, a place of residence, but it was also a place from which they could go out uh, and um, have fun. And I say have fun in quotes because, in fact, hunting was quite serious business. Um, it was a way of staying in shape through the winter months in all of those activities that were necessary for making it through the summer months of campaigning. Um, riding, shooting, um, acting as a group, it was a way, I think, um, and I would suggest it was a way of testing the people with me, whether they were reliable, whether they were trained properly, and whether I wanted them with me when my life was actually in danger as opposed to just chasing beasts around Thrace. Um, the other thing that I tried to do in this volume is the one, one of the firmans which has to do with Edirne is quite a long discussion of all of the things that have to be done in order to set up the hunting party that the Sultan was organizing in late December. It was good. They left uh, Edirne in late December and they spent um, 38 days romping around Thrace uh, hunting before they got back to Edirne. And we know this in part because we have 164 orders that were issued while they were on the hunt, uh, which tells us, again, something about the mobility of government, um, which we don't normally think about. And then one of the things that I did, let me see if I can do this correctly. Right, okay. So one of the things that I thought would be interesting to do would be to take the information that I have about this hunt in the 16th century and to see whether I could match it with other information I have from the chronicle of a man named Bertrandon de la Bocquière who went actually chasing the sultan in Thrace in 1433. He had come on a diplom as part of a diplomatic mission which went from Constantinople, Byzantine Constantinople, to meet the sultan in Ottoman Edirne. Uh, and when they got to Edirne, they were told, well, he's off hunting. And this diplomatic mission decides they're going to go tracking the sultan through Thrace to see if they can't catch up with him and have their meeting there. So they, f they follow him uh, until they get to the Greek city of Komotini uh, here, which is Ottoman Gumujine. Uh, and there they're told that, well, he's much further forward in Ceres, which is way over here. Uh, already in Macedonia. So they keep going a little farther to Zanti, at which point someone says, you know what, he doesn't want to talk to you. If you want to talk to him, go back to Edirne and wait until he gets there. And that's exactly what they do. They go back and then they have to sit there for two weeks till the Sultan comes back. And eventually they get their audience. So this is the trajectory of de la Broquière's group from Edirne out through Thrace. This is the way they come from Constantinople uh, up what's called the Via Militaris from the Roman period, and then they come down into Thrace and south of the Rhodope Mountains. So that was their trajectory. And then I took the waypoints um, from this hunting mission that was, this hunting party that was organized, and these are the points 
which are basically assigned as waypoints in the orders that are sent out, which you can see in the collection of the Muhime. And at each of these points, there's a certain amount of grain which is supposed to be there. There are other food supplies that are meant to be waiting for this hunting party when they get there. Uh, so they leave at Dirne and they go through Thrace, they get to Komotini, they go a bit further, and then they come back. If we overlay the two, um, we have an almost perfect match, which simply tells us that this is a very, very standard route, that it was a hunt that those were the hunting grounds for at least a hundred years, um, perhaps more, if I go on with this. Uh, and that these are the way stations that the Ottomans used, that this is a very typical kind of path for them to have taken. Um, so that was one exercise that I tried to do with, the, with information from two different sources, but quite um, uniquely from the Muhime source, for which I had, didn't have any, um, I hadn't previously found anything. Um, and so one of my questions is, okay, if I read this 16th century source, but I want to look at the 15th century, is there anything that I can really learn? I think that what the 16th century source has forced me to do is to think, okay, if it looked like this in the 16th century, would it have looked like that in the 15th, or would it have looked quite different? The Ottoman enterprise was much smaller in the 15th century, so the numbers of people and the quantities of things that are listed in the 16th century would have been um, much smaller. And that's just one example of the kind of question that, um, that comes to mind when, um, when I look at this. Um, it, what we can see is in the 15th century, when the sultan is actually based in Edirne, when he's actually sitting still, which is not that often, uh, in, the, in the 15th century. In the 16th century, the sultans are still spending months at a time based in Edirne. This entire volume of Muhime is written from Edirne. And it's an accident that we have this collection. It's very fortuitous for me that it was in the winter. And it shows us that this actually turns out to be the winter home or capital of the Ottomans for a, quite a long period after they've actually moved to Istanbul. And I think that, I mean, this is not the only source that shows us that, but to say, well, Istanbul was the capital for other months, but the winters were mostly spent in Edirne. If the winters are spent in Edirne and four to five months in the summer are spent campaigning, that doesn't leave so many months for the Sultan to be resident each year in Istanbul, at least in the, in the 16th century. And I think if we take that and then look at the way we've assumed Ottoman history works and the Ottoman world worked, um, it suggests that we need to re-examine um, some things. Um, I'm gonna just close because I know I don't have that long. Um, it's been a real opportunity to look back. Um, this, this meeting has really given me an opportunity to look back at Hayde's book. I haven't done it for many, many years. And to realize what the trajectory of Ottoman studies has been in the past uh, half century. It's been extraordinary. Um, there are dozens and dozens of people writing Ottoman history now. And I think the most telling thing is that when I was a graduate student some 30 years ago, I actually thought that by the time I got to this point, I might have read most of the corpus of published material about Ottoman history, Ottoman studies, not the entire source base, but that I would have gotten through most of the major publications. I don't even begin to have that aspiration anymore. It's too big. It's fantastic. Uh, and Hayde is one of the real foundational anchors of this research um, internationally, not just here, but really around the world um, with this collection of documents. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much.